Thanks a lot to the organizers again. It's been a wonderful week so far. And I look forward to the next few talks until uh, we all leave tomorrow, sadly. So yeah, uh, Jeffrey is not here now, but uh, basically he has done a very nice introduction already to interpolators. So my talk will be a bit less technical uh, and more trying to uh, tell a high level story with some bounds also that you will see to back that up. So it'll be a bit more, let's say, high level. Okay. Um, so basically what Jeffrey talked about in the morning, uh, he looked at the lo low noise case and uh, P equal to one, essentially you have minimum L1 or max L1 margin interpolators. Uh, they also have results for minimal L1 norm interpolators for regression. Um, for the low noise case. And so our results will be different from, from theirs in that regard that we will look at the IID noise case. So really just the normal F of X plus uh, noise and the noise is IID Gaussian. Um, but we'll have uh, some more assumptions. So we need Gaussian noise also we need Gaussian um, covariates. This is just to uh, compare perhaps these two works or, or position them. This is one of the differences. But again, so I will start with a much um, more high level story. So why do we actually care about interpolators and in particular these minimum L1 or LP or norm interpolators? Because I want to take a step back and go back to uh, neural network experiments. These are not the ones I did. These are from a um, paper by Nakiran et al from OpenAI. And so as Jeffrey said, usually in CIFAR 10, if you just train a neural network and look at the error on the test set, it's going to be really small. Um, and it's pretty noiseless or very small noise regime is really what the C410 data set looks like. But uh, interestingly, some interesting phenomena still hold when you add artificial noise. So if you, so the, these are experiments with, bless you, 15% artificial label noise added to the data set, and you still see some interesting phenomena. And the, the two phenomena that we will uh, look at or try to understand throughout the talk are as follows. So first, um, maybe you've been staring at this plot and not understanding what these lines are. So just focus on this blue line first. So the blue line is if you train a neural network with a first order method, I, I think they used Adam or, or one of those typical methods, uh, train until convergence, right? So, um, you can do that and just look at this blue line for now and ignore everything else. The x-axis is essentially if you take a ResNet 18 with a fixed depth and you increase the width. So there's a width parameter, you increase all the layers in some in a fashion. Um, and so that's that's essentially the model, not complexity, but some sort of, you know, you, you make the model bigger. Right. So this is when you increase X here and the Y would just show you the test error on a test set, which you didn't see during training. And if you look at this blue line, you will see two descents, right? So the first descent, of course, you first have to be able to fit something. You have to make the model large enough um, to be able to fit something. And then you will have, um, you will have a ascent. And this ascent is towards this interpolation threshold, which means at this point, uh, when the oops, when the ResNet has this width parameter, um, the training error can be equal to zero or is equal to zero. You don't see this on this uh, on the slide, but they have a 2D plot where you can see at this point training error zero. And then interestingly, it decays again after that point. So you have two descents, so it's called a double descent curve, if you've heard that or, uh, before. That's one of the phenomena that essentially after the interpolation threshold test error gets better again, even though training error is already zero and your model is just essentially learning perhaps nonsense, maybe uh, if you think classically, statistically, maybe, you know, what, why should you increase the model even further, especially if you have noise. This is uh, the double descent or the second descent is one of the phenomena. Okay, then the second phenomena you can stick with this um, plot actually, and now look at two curves. So the blue curve is still the same, the model at convergence, and the red curve is the one where at each width parameter, you just pick the model. You know, you, you, you of course, you save all your 
not all your models, but uh, multiple models at different epochs that you trained. And just pick the epoch, which gives you the model with the smallest test error. And this is basically hindsight optimal early stopping. It's a bit cheating, but that you can still look at how this test error looks like. And you will see, of course, here, uh, because you regularized, essentially early stopping is regularization. So you don't have this peak um, at the interpolation threshold. Um, but what we actually want to focus on is this regime and the very large uh, model regime. The regularized model is equal to if you don't regularize and train until convergence. Okay, this is the second um, second phenomenon that we, that we find interesting because if you think about Lasso, for example, a high dimensional statistic in the classical setting, um, you always, if, once you have noise, you will always need to regularize a little bit, right? You don't want to fit the noise. But here somehow it's saying, well, regularization uh, might not actually be needed. You can just train until convergence, yes. In both of the curves, you just train without penalty on the network weights? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, basically. Okay, so these are, yes. Third thing that jumps out at me, I don't know if it jumps out at anybody else, but notice what value it's asymptoting to, 0.3. Mm. It's twice your label noise. Yeah. That's what Tom Cover showed to expect for the nearest neighbor rule. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, not the nearest neighbor rule is best, but it's suggesting that what the neural net is doing is, is something akin to a nearest neighbor classifier, which could be outperformed if you're not in too high a dimension. If you had opportunity to take advantage of local smoothing, which you might not be able to because of the dimensionality yeah. um, of the input space. I don't know what that dimensionality is, you haven't said, but uh, yeah. An awful lot of fussing around with neural nets to just achieve that which a nearest neighbor rule would achieve. Yes, yes. Um, I agree here. Um, interesting that they do they do very well though. Whenever there's no noise, right, you get to like one percent error. So yeah, interesting observation. Yeah. Um, so, okay. so is this yes. plot, are these like numerical plots of the actual uh, sort of classification risk or are these simulations? No, no, this is like the actual curve. Actual curve that you, when you take your model and use it on the test set and compute the classification error on that, that that's all. Yeah, you compute this numerically, basically. Yes, you just feed the, the data through and you never look at Okay. So these are two phenomena that you see for your yeah. networks. This choice of the width parameter is so arbitrary. A lot of people like to choose the width parameter. Um, you could also look at that, for example, but uh, then it gets a bit complicated. Should you keep hyperparameters fixed or should you um, change the hyperparameters and optimize with respect to depth, et cetera? So there's a lot of design choices that uh, make it hard to, to, to compare um, with this, I guess, the simplest for optimization purpose. You can just keep a constant and then. Um, Increase your width, so that's that's why uh, maybe people used it. It's a very common choice. Okay, so now we want to understand why these two phenomena happen, and of course, neural networks are very complicated. Uh, there's lots of people in the room also that try to understand them, but for me, they're too complicated. So, for one, you have feature learning, um, meaning so if you just think of a two-layer neural network, right? So you're both are trying to learn the first and the second layer. Um, uh, over optimization here, again, our experiments was just the width, right? But the, the problem with um, feature learning is that you have a non comics optimization problem and it depends on instantization, it depends on your particular algorithm, et cetera, to get a particular interpolator. So it's quite messy um, to, to analyze. And um, so what a lot of people do instead they try to understand something much simpler first, which are the linear uh, interpolating models. And so, so maybe one motivation, or it's, it's a simplification from feature learning in that you're just not learning features, right? And so you're just saying, okay, I, um, I use uh, more and more features. So D would be the feature dimension. So it would not be the raw input dimension, but the feature dimension. So I can just um, use that as, as a proxy and of course, in the limit, I only get a kernel, uh, which is not very expressive in high dimensions, but still, you know, this, I can use this as a proxy for um, over just to look at 
the number of features being much larger than the sample size. So D is the number of features here. Um, some people look at the ratio D over N going to a particular uh, constant that's larger than one as D and O go to infinity, uh, D and N go to infinity, or they look at D of the order N to the beta and um, beta is the overpresentation ratio, well, um, overpresentation factor here. And then they look at how, you know, how the error behaves as you um, increase beta or you increase gamma. Um, okay, so here there's, these are uh, two models uh, at two ends of the scale of complexity to analyze. And so, so maybe here, okay, so uh, before I, I go on to comment on how useful that the, the linear part is, is maybe what are the actual the linear models people look at? Um, so as um, Jeffrey also um, uh, already talked about in, in, the, in the morning, so for classification, we often look at the max or we, the, the community, the theorists look at max L1 or max L2 margin interpolators, it's essentially um, hard LP SVM. And you have a unique solution because it's strictly convex for P uh, between one and two. And, and uh, yeah, and then for regression, you can look at the equivalent um, interpolating a model which minimizes the uh, um, LP norm. And why are these interesting? Um, also, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, basically, if you run first order methods, other boost or gradient descent, um, you might get a, a, the, 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 hard, uh, the max L1 or L2 margin interpolator. So it's essentially an implicit bias of some optimization method um, on some exponential losses. And in this case, for regression for the L2 losses, um, you would get the L2 interpolator, et cetera. So in some sense, they, these minimum norm interpolators can be seen as the result of some optimization method on, on the loss. And so that's why we like to study them. And also for P between one and two, there's recent work that also shows that it is the result of some optimization method on the exponentially tail losses. Okay, so that's why they're interesting. And so now what can we learn from them, right? So of course, if you have a very um, nice theory for these linear models, um, our original motivation were the neural network phenomena. And so, uh, a lot of people claim, you know, you know, we we understand something about neural networks. Uh, if we understand linear models, of course, that's that's not true. Even though the motivation is like this, we don't claim that you can explain anything, or that the intuition definitely carries over to neural networks and explain why ha things happen there. Um, neither do we claim that this theory helps you in practice. You know, uh, in terms of you know, you, you should use this and this interpolate in practice because in practice, of course. You should always regularize or choose the best regularization parameter. It might be very small. It might be larger. You just cross-validate. So in practice, this is also not interesting. But it's interesting to understand, perhaps, using linear models, when can interpolation work well, right? And to get some sort of a high-level idea. So if you don't have any intuition for even the simplest analyzable model, how can you hope to understand your networks? This is a motivation. And secondly, um, what also happens quite often is you you actually um, analyze linear models and you, you prove some uh, interesting phenomena that you can also see for neural networks. Um, and then using these insights, you, you can uh, come up with some hypothesis that is translatable to neural networks. And then often what you find is the experiments in the end that you do somehow uh, reflect your intuition. And so th these, are, these are, well, of course, usually this does not hold, but whenever this is true, it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, and so that's, of course, the hope to be able to come up with more principled hypotheses that you can test experimentally. Instead of just throwing a lot of experiments um, on new networks to understand them, you can perhaps go also this route. So maybe that's just a bit philosophical why the new models could be interesting here. Okay, let's go a bit uh, further uh, to, to the the actual theory. So um, again, linear models, uh, we consider X be, to be feature vectors and um, of dimension D. And the uh, underlying generating mechanism that people look at, so we will look at something very particular, but generally you have you know, the, the regression classification uh, model where you have uh, some noise. This could be uh, adversarial noise, low noise regime, or IID. And the XI come from some distribution and but very importantly, um, 
you need to assume some sparsity to be able to get generalization. Actually, uh, for p equal to two, people do, do not assume that, but okay, anyway. So, um, and then people look at the high dimension regime. That's just a summary of what I already said before. So in this regime, you know, what kind of interpolators can achieve good uh, test prediction performance or rather just um, prediction error performance? Um, especially for large beta and large gamma, right? So if you have a lot of dimensions compared to your sample size. Uh, okay, so I'll take a step back here um, and just think back to, you know, in, in the classical setting, what we all know about very well. So you have, you, when you assume sparsity, you can leverage this structure of the ground truth by trying to encourage the same structure on your estimator. And so here, of course, you also need restrict so many property and all this to, for it to work. But on a high level, um, using the right inductive bias here, L1, which is trying to encourage sparsity, that can give you perfect recovery uh, if you interpolate in the noiseless case at this basis pursuit, what everybody knows well. Um, whenever you add noise, however, you don't want to interpolate anymore. You want to sacrifice some of the fit and use some lambda that's non-zero to get a minimax estimation error. And so this is, a, in a nutshell, what you need to do. Why, why do you need to choose lambda bigger zero? Well, because if you choose lambda very large, then you force the model complexity to be too small. So your true W star might not be in there anymore. So this is your um, kind of a bias variance trade-off, essentially, that you need to optimize for p equal to one. Um, but if you choose a lambda too small, then you're going to fit noise. And so you need to go somewhere in between. This is the classical picture and what you also see in introduction to machine learning classes that I have to give. This is actually a plot from there. Um, so what is our take on, on this? So, so we basically um, have a new intuition. And this is for the case when you are forced to interpolate. So where you cannot choose lambda anymore because you are not allowed to regularize. Um, in this case, what I'm not allowed to do is the regulars, but I can choose my P perhaps. I can choose different kind of um, uh, encouragement, how much I encourage my estimator to be sparse. Uh, maybe L1 is basically the, the strongest one and L2 has no, basically no uh, encouragement, but maybe in the middle, um, there's, there's a sweet spot. So here, the, the x-axis now is not kind of model complexity, but more like strength of inductive bias. Yeah, exactly. So p equal to one would be the strongest. Yeah, it would be over here. Yeah, this is a bit. Okay. All right. Um, we'll see that uh, this this um, changing p actually has exactly a similar effect in terms of uh, having a bias going down. Of course, if p equal to one, in the noiseless case, you will. Uh, recover your ground truth, but then um, if you have noise, then p equal to one will um, be more sensitive to noise than p equal to two. That's kind of a, the um, intuition. And that's kind of what we try to try to um, support with concrete bounds. Yeah. And I think of the right-hand side as so if I fix P and I let lambda go to infinity on the left side, I get the same thing, right? Uh, if I fix, no, I mean, what do you mean you get the same thing? Like in which, oh, no, no, sorry, lambda. So lambda to zero, lambda to zero is essentially, then you are here, you, 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 have, to, you have to do an interpolation. Yeah, lambda, you, to yeah. lambda to zero, yeah. Right. Okay, so, so this is um, maybe this, this will come over and over again, but this is just maybe before we move on to previous work, et cetera. This is what um, this talk would be about. Okay. So, previous work um, has also tried to prove these um, observations, or rather, prove bounds that reflect these observations for p equal to 2. Um, so, maybe I show this here. So, for P to for the two, there are essentially two regimes, or for any P, there are two regimes. One regime is when P over N goes to a constant um, that is bigger than one. In that case, you have inconsistency, uh, which means that as D and N go to infinity, your 
um, error will be bigger than zero, strictly bigger than zero, and stay, stay strictly bigger than zero. So it's really a regime where you don't generalize well, I mean, you're inconsistent in some way, but you can show double descent there, but we, which means that the error at convert um, at um, when the n go to infinity, that error um, has a double descent curve corresponding to this gamma essentially. On a high level, they showed the second descent after interpolation dash. Okay. Uh, then uh, there's no assumption on W star here. We don't need that because L2. And, and then uh, they also look at non asymptotic rates, uh, where basically in the regime where D over n goes to infinity, for example, D is n squared, as n goes to infinity, it goes to infinity. And in that case, you can achieve consistency, but only for very special covariance matrices. Okay? These have to be very spiked. Uh, and the error they look at is the prediction error, which means that we have a very spiked covariance matrix, so say one and then very, very small. Then the prediction error only cares about basically one element uh, of your estimation of that we had. So in some way, uh, this prediction error with the spike covariance is perhaps a bit misleading. So essentially you could also just learn nothing. Yeah. So what do you mean by no assumption on W star? Because actually they they I mean there is an assumption that's just hidden because in R D, so sorry, this is the dimension. So somehow this vector is supposed to be of square root of D. It's actually something that depends on D implicitly. So you need this vector to be not sure. sparse but at least to have some like be able to partitionate the space or D into Two spaces where most of the direction, most of the mass of the W star is. Otherwise, that's not going to work. Sure, I mean, not for any W star, yeah, but yeah. if you have bound a norm or something, yes. But I'm just saying, like, in terms of structure, you don't need, like, yeah, okay. a particular no, structure. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, then for P equal to one, um, which is perhaps where you can hope for better generalization in the high dimensional regime, uh, there has been work also on the asymptotics. And we heard in the morning, um, Jeffrey gave a talk on the low noise regime. And they showed also for regression um, some nice results. But the essentially, um, as I say, the low noise is interesting, but you also see double descent in the constant noise regime. So we want to understand um, if we can also understand that regime um, because the proofs would be quite different. And so this talk is about IID noise. We will see that for p equal to one, you can get consistency, but the, noise, the rate is very, very uh, slow, which means that the second observation here is not explained. Um, can we get an interpolator that makes regularization essentially obsolete? And that's why we go into this column where p is in between one and two, and there we show that you can actually get um, rates that are close to one over n, but with some caveats, we'll see. Okay, um, yeah, so we fill the square. Uh, okay, so before I go to our work, um, I'll just quickly uh, go through some uh, intuition. Actually, yeah, I'll just quickly go through that, um, that um, previous, previous work has established on why you know, having larger organization uh, makes regularization futile. There is some uh, intuition already that we can build on, but the bounds are, are not good enough. So in our work, um, we then show essentially that you get rates close to one over n um, for p in between one and two. But you need, this only holds for very large DNN, so that's the caveat. And then we also give intuition for this new uh, bias variance trade-off that I alluded to in the beginning. Okay, so previous work, has studied p equal to two, and on this you can already learn quite a few things. Um, so just this very simple setting, um, Gaussians, isotropic Gaussians, um, Gaussian noise, and you look at the L2 norm interpolator regression, and then you compare this with a regularized estimator, which is the rich estimator with optimal lambda, and then you get these two curves. So the black one is the interpolating one, it has a peak uh, at interpolation, and the green one is the regularized one, which kind of smoothens out the peak, or peak doesn't happen there. And here we actually see both observations already, right? For this very simple linear model, 
um, the error decreases after interpolation threshold and oops and um, regularization is futile when gamma is very large so um, why is that the case here again you actually have something um, happening with the bias invariance so as d so let's fix n and you increase d and when you do this the variance actually decreases so i wrote down some algebra it doesn't really matter um, but the variance decreases uh, intuitively what happens is you have more dimensions to absorb noise and then you can go through this calculation to see what i mean by that but it's um, not too relevant this is quite simple to see um, and then the bias of course increases because you have more flexibility you have to search over more uh, a larger space to find the signal so if you go from d to d plus one this this bias will increase so you get um, as gamma the over polarization ratio increases you get these two curves um, and what this means that the variance decreases it means that essentially if you regularize right you try to not fit noise because you wanted to limit the effect of noise so you have lambda bigger zero basically as you increase gamma the effect of noise will get smaller and smaller you you need the regularization less and less so hence as gamma grows regularization becomes futile so this is essentially um, one way they something you can learn from the literature of p equal to two um, so okay. now we just uh, move on to this uh, instead of looking at a particular interpolator we want to compare um, different ones and see if we can get some reasonable rates um, so this is just a reminder of our setting so this is just a typical data distribution generating distribution here uh, crucially we need gaussian isotropic uh, distributions on the covariates and gaussian noise this is different than in jeffrey's case because uh, some of the tight bounds really rely on this gaussian assumption because we use a gaussian min max theorem and um, we have these interpolators and then what we care about are these um, performance metrics so essentially here the estimation error is the same as the prediction error and um, here for classification we have a di directional error so we normalize the um, the vectors um, w hat w star and compare just basically if they align in the, in terms of the directions okay what are some results so p equal to one it was not clear before our result whether uh, you can actually achieve high dimensional consistency um, meaning there was a lower bound that was saying you you can it is a log d um, one over log d over n so if d is of the order n squared for example then as n grows you would go to zero really? if d is of the order yeah, n squared okay. yeah, yeah. Um, but there, there are some uh, okay, so people have not really looked at upper bounds, but if you use the adversarial noise kind of setting, then you don't get a good enough bounds for the IAD noise setting. So you only get constant upper bounds. So it's not clear, can you actually get consistency? It's just this lower bound not tied or is this upper bound not tied? And so we just closed the gap and said, okay, uh, we proved that essentially you get a constant optimal bounds on W hat minus W star if you assume the sparsity constraint essentially w stars um, the the sparsity s is smaller than n over uh, log d over n the constants here the constants are also not dependent on d etc they're actually fixed constants everywhere when you see the sign and uh huh? what does fixed mean the numerical there exists constants such that well, and then they don't depend on anything but number. huh? they're numbers yeah, numbers one to three or something. Um, okay. And so this result is basically saying okay, this lower bond was actually tight. And um, yeah, it was high probably over data. This, uh, this bond is true. So this implies asymptotic consistency. However, actually, do I have some more? Yeah, so this is a, okay, wait. Experimentally, this bound is also tight beyond Gaussians, but we cannot show it. This is a bit sad. So here, if you uh, plot these numerically uh, numerical experiments, you can see that also other distributions like log, log normal or, or Rodemacher can uh, follow this um, 
this line pretty closely, which is essentially this line sigma squared over long Lagrange. But somehow we cannot prove it because our proof relies on a Gaussian max theorem. And so this is a bit sad, one of the caveats. And then we also show uh, for classification that we get one over log d of n, but in that case, the constant is not optimal. Uh, yeah, so this is for p equal to one. And maybe now you already see that, that this rate that you get uh, is quite slow. It's one over log n essentially. Uh, so even though we can see that if you increase beta, so if d is equal to n to the beta, uh, then as beta grows, your bound gets uh, better or smaller. Uh, that's not very surprising, but uh, the second uh, observation cannot be shown. So here, the interpolator rate is one over log n, which is much, much slower than the best regularized rate, one over n, right? So here we have a huge gap, and the question is, can we close that essentially with uh, different interpolators? And the answer is yes. So now the next two slides are a bit complicated to parse, at least this, uh, this picture. Um, it's an informal statement because if you really looked at the formal statement that is um, for general D and N, um, then it would just take an hour to explain. So, so I have a plot for the actual rate results instead. So here we just assume D is of the order N beta, uh, to just plug it in, then we can actually look at the rates. Um, and we need this for n large enough. P is in between one and two, and beta is also um, smaller than something dependent on P. Then we have these rates of order polynomial rates, n to the minus alpha, um, as here, as written below here. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe uh, how do we parse this uh, plot? So first, Beta is on the x-axis. So as I increase beta, the, the, I increase the over parameterization. And then on the y-axis, um, one over n rate is the best. So lower is better or faster. Okay, so let's uh, start perhaps uh, looking at a fixed beta. For fixed beta, in this case, um, if you compare the rates for different p's, so these lines are corresponding to different p's, you can see that for p that is very close to one, um, you can get a rate that's very close to one over n. Then for beta close to two, you get the best rates that are even closer to one over n. And this is um, for classification, you actually see a nicer picture where it's exactly one over n up to log constants, of course, uh, up to log factors. Uh, Okay, so this is one way to parse the um, plot. And so there are some caveats I want to mention. Perhaps you're also already wondering. Okay, so this is for one sparse ground truth here. This is currently in our paper, but we are working to generalize to S sparse. Um, but the S cannot depend on N or D, it has to be fixed. Then uh, this technique, uh, we believe that um, we can also analyze uh, spike covariances. Um, uh, but there are some caveats that we don't know really how to get rid of, which is this, uh, that we require n large enough, or rather, or at the same time, if n is large enough, d is large enough. Um, for example, we require 1 over log log d to be smaller than p minus 1, and that d is really huge. Uh, so, so in some way, it's more like an asymptotic result in terms of d and n, but um, yeah, so this comes in because we're trying to get really tight bounds on the Q norm of a Gaussian vector, essentially. This assumption is log log factor is because normally, essentially, the L1 norm is equivalent to, I mean, doing a LP norm is equivalent to the L1 norm <coughs> log log regime. That's why you have that norm. But imagine you do a LP, LP minimization uh, where P is really close to one. Mm -hmm. Up to a log log factor, and I think you can show that actually the L1 norm is equivalent to the geometry. Actually, they're of the not, norm. and that's the point what we're trying to make here that just adding this log log factor changes uh, the rate uh, drastically, actually. So it's essentially you get a very good rate, and then you kind of have this space in the show. If you are too close to log log uh, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're too close to one, then you're again. Uh, so the, Okay, um, the se second caveat is maybe you're wondering why do we show a plot like this and why not just show for fixed beta what the best P is? That's also because of uh, basically um, this restriction. 
So uh, we don't have the entire range p from one to two. We only have from one plus one over log of to two. Anyway, don't want to dwell on this too much because uh, this is uh, yeah we don't care about the technical bounds that much. It's more about the the story later on. So I want to move on here, perhaps. Um, so for classification, looks a bit more clean at least in this area here. Uh, you actually get uh, exact polynomial rate of one over n up to log factors um, in this range where beta is bigger than two and p is smaller than this. Yeah. And so if we go back to our observations, so now we have shown for the um, sparse setting, uh, IRD noise setting, that these two observations also hold true for linear models. Okay, so this, this is nice. And we also showed something else, which is uh, that if you choose P in between one and two, which is not the strongest, which you might expect would be the best, then you actually get a much faster rate than um, if you just choose P equal to one. Yeah. Uh, do you have like a bound that depends on P exactly? So fix yes. beta, let's say beta is equal to two. Do you know which P you should choose? More optimizing, yeah. optimizing over P. Yeah, yeah, that was exactly what I was trying to say with the caveat here that uh, it might be smaller than what we can have analyzed. So the minimum is actually below one plus one over log of P. Okay. So, so, so that's why we cannot give an actual, uh, yeah. Uh, um, but this would be what we really want. And so we are also looking into elastic net right now. Um, and see maybe there we can cover the entire space of interpolating between R1 and L2. Um, okay, so here are just some numerical experiments. Uh, because of this, you know, requiring huge D, uh, it's relatively hard, but we can still do some experiments and, and see some trends that, that are uh, encouraging, at least that maybe also for finite D and N, you can see some behavior like this. So here, um, sigma is uh, random label flips. So here we have classification. Um, so blue is when you don't have any noise and you have a sparse ground truth. Of course, you pick P equal to one. Uh, but if you add a bit of noise, the best P is going to shift towards two. The high dimensional regime. And we also have a real world experiment where uh, we do the same. So uh, sigma equal zero is essentially saying, this we just don't add artificial noise and here the best p is also equal to one of course we don't know whether the ground truth is sparse or something but it seems to be helpful to have strong inductive bias um, and then adding some noise the the optimum shifts uh, towards two again now we don't have experiments yet for for the regularized case but uh, we assume that this is going to be a bit better because it's finite DNN. Okay, so last but not least, um, back to this uh, bias variance story as a function of the inductive bias. Um, so we analyzed uh, P equal to one and there's a lot of work on P equal to two. And so um, why would I want to go towards P equal to two? Um, and that's because if I um, add dimensions, um, I want to perhaps, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the capability of P equal to two to kind of absorb noise. Okay, so because P equal to one is very sensitive to noise, it's, it's just one experiment we did here. We just increased noise and looked at the error here um, of the interpolators. And for the minimum L1 norm interpolator, it's just much more sensitive. It's, it's just to get a sense that there, there's no, no more behind this plot. Um, and so, we also estimated the bias and variance um, in experiments, and this is basically how these look like after a lot of averaging. Um, the, indeed, the bias uh, goes up um, as your inductive bias strength is, okay, now, I'm sorry, now it's, everything is reversed, right? So I had a, a P originally going to one on the right side, now it's flipped. Um, so if I decrease my inductive bias strength, of course my bias goes up, but my variance goes down. Okay, so here again, uh, this is the story you want to be in between somehow. Okay, so now this is interesting perhaps for linear models, but uh, the question is in the beginning, I said you perhaps want to 
come up with a hypothesis that you can test in neural networks empirically. And so what would be the equivalent hypothesis here? So generally, the strength of inductive bias is already somewhat vague enough that you could perhaps translate it. Um, but what is the right inductive bias for neural networks is the question. Right, so for, for sparse ground truth, you know, you know P, LP or P is equal to one is very strong and vice versa, P equal to two is not strong. But what about for neural networks and for certain data sets, you don't know the ground truth, you don't know the structure or the simple structure of the ground truth that you can try to enforce. So perhaps there's some convolutions, et cetera, but it's not entirely clear, um, for example, what the inductive bias of adding depth is. So maybe some of you have a better intuition, but um, it's, it's not entirely clear, uh, even though a lot of people try to understand. So, so maybe we can, uh, so what we did, preliminary experiments are just to get rid of the uh, problems with neural network training. And we just looked at kernels and added structure in the sense of depth actually. Um, but it's slightly random how we, we just tried to see if we can see uh, something there that shows that the best, um, the best interpolator for noiseless is not the same as the interpolator if you add some noise. So that we saw, but what exactly inductive biases, we don't know. But you see, we saw here, if we increase depth, or actually decrease depth in this case for MNIST, because it's a very simple data set, you don't need that much depth. Um, small depth is actually the best for the noiseless case. Um, but if you add some noise, you also want to kind of go towards a higher depth, which was actually not the best for the noiseless case. So there could be something happening also for neural networks. Um, we do have some plans how to uh, go about this. For example, um, one suggestion also by some empirical folks was um, you could use data augmentation as kind of a proxy for inducing strong inductive bias, um, essentially saying, for example, you, you do data augmentation with certain transformations, and the strength would be how many uh, images you sample to enforce the invariance towards these transformations. Uh, this would be one way to perhaps um, check whether this hypothesis is also true for neural networks. And basically, as you increase noise, perhaps you need less and less, uh, fewer and fewer images um, that are augmented. Smaller inductive by the smaller indu inductive bias. Yeah. Um, right. So, so basically, uh, just to sum up, uh, there were lots of bounds also, but the most important takeaway is perhaps that interpolation on noisy data can generalize uh, pretty well, almost as well as regularized, or basically as well as regularized estimators, if you moderate the strength of your inductive bias. Um, that should be the takeaway of this talk. And then the follow-up work is to kind of extend uh, to perhaps other estimators such as uh, interpolators such as uh, perhaps elastic net, uh, meaning minimum of L1 plus L2 with some weights and such that it interpolates. Um, we're also looking into kernels um, with structure. So structure could be, again, filter size, for example, of convolutional um, structures. And then, yeah, so, so I already talked about the experiments we were planning. And um, we also want to look at general covariances, perhaps, for the bounds. So that's it from my side. If happy to take any questions. Yeah. 